This has to be the longest vintner's tale, because our vintner, Harry Waugh, is vintage 1904, which makes him not just Britain's most influential wine merchant, but also the most mature. He's been showered with honours, and it's typical of the man that this is where he chooses to keep them. Harry Waugh had to work his way up in the wine trade, which he joined by chance as a clerk after leaving school at 16. He built up Harvey's of Bristol as a fine wine merchant capable of training the current head of Christie's wine department and the head of Allied Lions. He's written a series of wine diaries and is consultant to Annabelle's, for instance, but has always been much more celebrated in America than here. When you were working for Block Grain Block, port was very important in your portfolio. Yes. But the firm had to make a very expensive decision, didn't it? Yes. Um, the firm had been doing badly. All the wine trade was doing badly. The, right through the 20s, the 28, 29 um, recession was bad, and then there was the rise of Hitler. And every time Hitler moved into a new country, the stock exchange used to collapse and our customers drop away. And so we, we had no money. And meanwhile, the, the, the cream of the young men from London were joining the army and going to Sandhurst. And there, they're having me properly brought up. They drank, taught to drink port every night. And one of our marks, which we sold, my firm, Block Red Block, sold to Sandhurst, was called Big Ben Port, which was a vintage character port. And we hadn't got enough money to buy all this port that was demanded of us. Quite cheap port, really, needed. Well, it was, yes, a vintage character, a wood port. Mm. So, uh, to make ends meet, we bought a lot of the 1931 vintage, which was, we couldn't sell. You couldn't sell port. There was, it was only five cents a bottle which was nothing, not five shillings is now, but it was nothing. And uh, so we, we decanted those bottles and put them into the, in the Big Ben. So the young men in, at Sandhurst drank really good Big Ben port. <laughs> and that's a port that today would sell for about £350 a bottle. It's something like that. <laughs> it's tis the port of the, of the century, you know. <laughs> and in 1939, just before the war, you did something that was um, pretty revolutionary for a wine merchant then. Yes, it was thanks to late Alan Sichel. He asked me to go abroad with him on a wine trip. Because most wine merchants then didn't No, no hardly anybody in the wine trade went abroad at all. And I thought it was a wonderful opportunity, and we, we started, went to Champagne first. And then we went to Alsace. And nobody in England knew anything about Alsace at all, but Alan Sichel was very keen on it. We tasted work morning to night, tasting, tasting, tasting. And then we went to Burgundy and then to Bordeaux. So it was a great experience and extraordinary. Driving on the roads then, the, the, the went main roads are on now, and they used to be held up by flocks of sheep and goats and cows and things like that. <laughs> Didn't you take a stand on Beaujolais as well? Yes, I did. Um, I found about 1949-50, I'd only been back in the wine trade about four or five years, and I realised the, the Beaujolais ship to England all came through the, the big firms in Bowen, which were 100 miles north of the Beaujolais district. And I thought perhaps I could be able to do something better. So through a friend, I got an introduction to, a, finally through a broker in, in Beaujolais. And he introduced me to the leading growers there. Uh, and so Harvey's had wine, which came direct from the growers' cellars. As you know, um, we haven't got um, a California Chardonnay on our list at the moment. So we thought it would be a good idea to try a variety of the Californians to see if there was one that you thought was suitable both on price and quality. So we can see if there's anything we want to buy. We want one or more. One. I think one. We've got one Australian. I think we would only want one, yes, because it's early days mm. for our members. Um, Harry, where would you like to start? I'll start here. Start up here. Right. Harry, the archetypal wine trade gentleman, serves on the wine committee of two London clubs. This one regularly includes three masters of wine and a director of Christie's. Harry, you probably have much more experience of Californian than we do, as you've been out there on so many occasions. <laughs> I, I was the first person ever to bring, let people know California was good, first European anyway. No, no, nobody from Europe realised in 19 <laughs> it was. Well, the, um, Yes, 60s, 60s. They changed their methods 
all together making the wine. It had been done in huge redwood tanks. And then they kept it in bottle only for a year and sold it off. And it was pretty poor stuff. You've been involved with the Bordeaux First Growth Chateau Latour since 1963. And Latour became a, a revolutionary property and franchise, didn't it? Well, indeed, because we, we had to completely redo it. Our first vintage was 1963. Fortunately, it was not a good vintage. We lost one of the huge vats of wine, which were fermenting. All the wine was lost. And we suddenly realised the vats were over 100 years old and all had to be replaced. And there were great arguments as whether we should have stainless steel or, or wooden vats, the original traditional ones, or um, cement line, glass line, cement tanks. And because I'd been in California and seen how good the stainless steel were, how effective they were, thank goodness they listened. And so we, we installed these vets. It caused a sensation. But fortunately, 64 was our first vintage. It was probably the best wine of the whole vintage. So that proved that the stainless steel was good. Technology is a lot more important in today's wine world, isn't it? Do you think wines made today are better or worse? Oh, I think infinitely better, infinitely better. Yes, <laughs> well, it's here. Now, this one, this looks well, very um, smart. Yes, that's it. All the national you made. And that's what, what allows you to wear this that's blue it, thing that's it. on your suits. That's uh, it. But I know in France they can't say Harry Wall, can they? What do they say? Oh, they can't pronounce it there. No. Vaux. Vaux. Arrivaux. Arrivaux. <laughs> yes, that's right. Now, this is one that... Um, now, this I'm more proud rare, of than anything else. Very rare. This is the greatest yes. compliment the wine trade could pay me. An without honorary, exception. An honorary master of wine. So mm. you are allowed to be an MW without ever having had to take an exam. Without taking an exam, yes. So I'm very, very proud of that one. Mm. A lot of people don't envy that. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what goes behind here. Why did you ask Harry to be a director of John Armick Wines? Um, I thought I needed a bit of credibility. <laughs> and I've always admired Harry. I thought he was the greatest man in the wine trade in, in England and had been for many years. And the, and the forerunner, really, of many of the things that I've always wanted to do. It's a curious thing in England, though. I think, in a way, we are, we're, we're wary of, of success and fame and we don't appreciate it in the way that we should. And I think there's another aspect which is specific to England, is, um, which is that we don't respect age in the way that happens in other parts of the world. <laughs> and what about your own cellar? Well, alas, I did have a most lovely cellar, but having these two children Now these are educate. your twins, My Jamie twins. and Harriet, who arrived um, when you were how old? 69. <laughs> and it was in the headlines. They'd, Oh, there was a William Hickey with the Daily Mail. So headlines, Harry Moore, his twins at 69. <laughs> 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 They're now aged 18. And the education has cost so much, I've had to sell most of my wine to pay for it. I've still got a little left to pay for the rest of it. <laughs> it's saddening because there's some lovely stuff there. <laughs> This is the tale of a very big vintner and quite a small business, Reed Wines, based here by this mill stream between Bath and Wells. I've never heard anyone say a bad word about Bill Baker, although he may not be his doctor's idea of a model patient. Bill Baker's one of the very few wine merchants who embraces what he eats as enthusiastically as what he drinks. <laughs> What 
what are you seriously trying to do at the moment? Well, we always collect a lot of samples up, uh, and every so often, hopefully with most of the members of the business here, we taste through them. Now, today it's just Simon and I, and we just want to look at some sparkling wines and champagne. We've got a few samples in, and we just thought we'd have a go and see if they're any good, and obviously you can give us your professional opinion as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is... it's ugly, it's green, it, it doesn't smell of Chardonnay at all. I don't know what, uh, what the, the cepage is in the wine, but it really isn't at all nice. Uh, and then in the finish, it is green as grass. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 the acidity grabs your tongue and tries to wrench it from your mouth. It's so horrid. Yucko. We won't be having that. that. Yucko. <laughs> yeah. Were you always interested in food and drink? Um, well, to an extent, yes. I certainly remember being horrified when first going to school, how disgusting the food was. In fact, I mounted a campaign to try and improve it by taking photographs and supposedly sending them to the Daily Mail. <laughs> but uh, sadly, the housemaster intercepted the post and they never reached their target. And I was severely reprimanded for this. The food was just so revolting that uh, one had to be interested in food. So I went to the local town and tried to get things to cook. What sort of things? I used to do six egg omelettes. Those just about stayed the, the hunger off for a day or two. Uh, large chunks of steak with pepper and nata and things like that. Nothing terribly. You know, you only had two gas rings and they were very sordid. But it did certainly uh, stave off the pangs of hunger. Did you ever bring food and drink into your academic work? Uh, I did because I was asked to write a project on uh, something French after having completed O level, uh, and uh, I chose to do it on on food and drink, on French food and drink, merely because I walked into the school bookshop one day and found that box set of Elizabeth David cookery books that was uh, around at the time, and I started reading them and made the mouth water somewhat, especially when one had belly pork swimming in 15 inches of fat at lunchtime, and it was rather impossible to eat. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I read through French provincial cooking and decided the thing to do was to try and match French provincial food with the particular wines from the regions concerned. Read wines. Hello. This is what one might call the skeleton staff of reed wines, where the ledger and carbon paper still rule. Presumably the local shop just stopped stocking quill pens. You specialise in really pretty fine wine. Well, we don't sell any crap, but we do have good, cheap wine as well, and it's something that, that Reed Wines has increasingly started to do in the last three or four years because of demand. But what's special about Reed Wines is that you're prepared to sell really quite fine wine by the single bottle. Yes, you have to, I think, to the, to the sort of accounts that we deal with. People do not want to buy cases of 61 clarets, even 70 clarets. And they'll buy little 1983s and 82s, of course, but they won't buy expensive bottles in huge quantities. Yes, we, we, we enjoy selling single bottles. It's, it's a nice way of doing it. It means, A, we can drink them uh, when we want to, just to check they're all right, of course. And, uh, and uh, B, that we can, we can touch them. I like touching things, you see. <laughs> But your list is very particular. You, you write all these comments. Um, what did I just read? The, about the 67 claret vintage. You said, not quite as vile as the 68. Well, is it, I don't know if it's about the 67. It could well be. 67 uh, is a very curate's egg vintage. There's some good ones, not very many now, and some extremely disgusting ones. But I like to tell people, we, we try to be honest, we never sell a bottle of wine if we've tasted it. If somebody asks the, our opinion on a bottle of wine that we've tasted, we'll tell them if it's naff. We'll tell them if it's disgusting. The thing that I find remarkable is that the comments, the more derogatory the comment, the more readily the wine sells. <laughs> I once wrote about a Cadet Piola 1950. Disgusting wine, pretty label, and it was the first thing that sold in the list. <laughs> Charterhouse, Peterhouse, and now this old mill house where Bill both works and lives with his wife Kate and Dipper.
Bill's made a speciality of supplying restaurants and country house hotels, not exactly a growth area at the moment. At one stage, he was driving hundreds of miles and eating two feasts a day. But since he met Kate, when she was working at Gidley Park in Devon, he travels less and has slimmed down. What proportion of wine merchants do you think actually make money? Not many. You can, if you're unscrupulous, buy things cheap from private sellers and sell them very expensively. That's something we've never done. We've always given a fair price. And that is why we get, continue to be offered good private sellers. And I'd far prefer to buy from private sellers than, say, in the auction rooms. We do buy in the auction rooms, but we try to buy as much as we can from private sellers. Uh, why? Why? Because you know how the stuff's been stored. You go and see Colonel Bloggins in Ashfield or wherever, and you look at his bottles of Lafitte 45 and hope you're not knocked over on the way out by his ridgeback, which I nearly was carrying a case of 45 Lafitte once. Um, uh, but uh, you can see the stuff, and you can look at it before you buy it. Buying in the rooms is always a risk. You don't know how it's been stored. You don't know how it's been stored. You don't know where it's been stored. You don't know if it's been across the Atlantic three times. Uh, and there's a lot of that about at the moment because uh, we are uh, able to buy good claret from the States at the knockdown price. Now, you have a particularly distinctive way of chasing up bad payers in the restaurant business, don't you? Uh, this is another very useful piece of reputation which stems from an incident well about eight years ago in a particular restaurant. Uh, despite reminders, over eight months had decided not to pay their niggardy account of 350 quid. Uh, and uh, so I decided that we would go and uh, eat the debt. So we sat down and we ordered everything that was most expensive off the, off the menu and a couple of good bottles of wine. In fact, when we'd finished, the uh, bill came to about 40 quid more than they owed us. So I strode into the kitchen with two twenties and asked to see the proprietor, who was about five foot, I suppose, and despite holding a meat cleaver, rather quaking behind his range. <laughs> and uh, so, so I said, uh, I'm Bill Baker from Reed Wines. You've owed us 350 quid for the last eight months. Uh, we've had a very nice dinner, which we had. It was absolutely delicious. Sadly, the restaurant is no more. I can't imagine why. And uh, we, uh, I gave him the 40 quid and said, listen, you're very lucky to get this. Don't ever try to buy from me again. Throughout the entire exchange, he was speechless. The two young vintners in this tale sell seven million pounds worth of wine a year without ever having to lift anything heavier than a telephone. Far vintners trade the finest and rarest of wines like a commodity, with customers prepared to spend an average of two thousand pounds a time, and that could easily be for one bottle. Every bottle in Farr's smart new Pimlico premises is empty. Another milestone in the enviably complete wine education of ex-van driver Stephen Browett and ex-Harrods trainee Lindsay Hamilton. John, it's Alison. Um, 19 cases of Petrus 88 delivered to Washington Airport yesterday. Should have been. Can you confirm that they're there and also let me know when you'll be flying them? Thank you. Farr Vintners was born in 1978 in an 11th floor council flat. At that stage, Lindsay did deliveries in a Robin Reliant, and Steve was still studying French. Today, they drive, respectively, 
a vast BMW and a sensible VW oh, estate. Sorry to be rude to you. I've got someone on the other line. Okay. All right. Okay, bye. Christoph. Ah, oh, thanks. Salut, Christoph. Salut, Sarah. Sarah. Oui, oui, oui. Steven, est-ce que tu as dit le tour 45? Le tour 45. Euh, oui, on a, on a six bouteilles. Oui. À 500 litres le bouton. Hi, Charles, it's Lindsay. Um, about this Pichon 70, what, what's the, the best price that you could um, do? Um, how much more do you want? Well, hang on, just one second. Steve. Yeah. Uh, Charles has got uh, three cases of Pichon 70. What's the best price? 520. You don't want to pay more than that. Okay. And we could pay 510. I think, uh, I think we should. I, I just take that. Okay, could, could we have them to trap some, please? In the trap? Yeah. Um, I don't think they're in the original wooden boxes. They're not OWCs, David. Okay. Just a second. The, the levels are in the neck? Levels are in the neck. Lovely. Okay. We'll take them. 510. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye. What are your two vintages? 57. And I was a much better vintage. I was 59, which uh, is a great one to be born in because it's one of the best, as you know. How do the vintages relate to your characters? Uh, well, 59. I, I tell you about his, and he's just there about mine. Well, 57 is, is quite uh, lean and uh, austere and really getting on a bit, uh, almost past its best. But, uh, but there are some very, very nice wines in 57, but you need to be guided uh, as to which one to buy and drink. Attractive and rather plump, the 59 vintage, but uh, still very good. And extremely generous. <laughs> How do you think the, the rest of the wine trade would describe you? Well, they probably think we're upstarts a little bit, in that uh, we, uh, we haven't been doing this for 50 years or something, but uh, they're probably a little bit jealous of our success. Right, it's got a case. And it's all mixed wines, and he wants to have some prices. Okay, what is that? Route on 70. So, 800 a case. Petrus 70. A wine merchant of the old school walks in off the street with a box of goodies to be valued, all in a day's work. 300 a case. Come from a private cellar. Over on 66, the label's a bit tall. Yeah, I think it'll be all right. It's just that the food that's really bad. And the wine doesn't taste much good. You could have that discussion. Has been happening, happening, isn't it? Is it? This six right. litre Imperial of Chateau Latour 1961, on the other hand, impresses even Du Bois. It's worth more unopened, with no one exactly sure what condition it's in. Actually, there's a bond rotation 86, so it probably just only shipped in 86. So. It's not been opened, but there's no splits or anything. No, okay, I think we'll leave it. Right. Pedant. It's so rare that they have no difficulty in selling this jumbo-sized Bordeaux first growth for £4,200. And are prices more or less even across the, the five first growths? No, the, the one that everybody wants is the Mouton Rothschild because they have an artist label. They started doing artist labels in forty-five, and the old vintages of, of that are often or double or even treble the price of the other first growth. Regardless of the quality of the wine in the bottle? Yeah, in fact, the, the worse the quality of the wine, the more expensive it is, because obviously a, a lesser quality wine would have been drunk earlier. Um, a 1950 could have been drunk in the 50s or the early 60s, and there's less of it around, um, because there was no point in keeping it. And now, because people want the artist's label, it's, uh, it's a very expensive wine. That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, there must be all sorts of instances when you know that the price you're selling something at is really unrelated to the, the quality Absolutely. of the wine in the bottle. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another thing that we feel is the important role of a fine wine merchant, is not just to tell people what's a great yeah. wine, but also to tell them what's a good value. I mean, everybody knows that Chateau Petrus is a great wine, but when you're talking up to a thousand pounds a bottle, our role sometimes is to tell people, well, we've got another one that's nearly as good, but a lot cheaper. Lot 10.37, bidding will open at uh, 180, 190, 200 pounds. Unique among British wine merchants, Steve attends every single London wine auction, tracking price movements with terrier-like tenacity, 
His French degree has made him unusually effective in foreign sale rooms too. 300 pounds, a right at the back of 300 pounds. All three. And do you actually put your own money into wine? You have your own cellars? We have uh, own small cellars. Um, until recently, we didn't have money to put into, into wine anyway. Um, so, yes, I mean, mainly just drinking wine, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, buying on Premier is something that we don't do at all because the wines that we well, except uh, buy, for, we drink now. Except for reasons like you got married and you wanted to buy That's true. things like that, and I've got a child and I wanted to buy something for him. So, not totally logical financial decisions, but emotional decisions, and I think wine is more of an emotional subject than purely a financial subject. In your rise to, to prominence, what's given you the most personal satisfaction? That's difficult. I don't think it's particularly uh, the, the money or the, uh, or the prestige. I think it's, it's to be able to drink good wines whenever, whenever we, we want to and to, and, to, and to become an expert in a certain field that gives, gives you a lot of satisfaction to say, I've drunk all these vintages of all those ch chateaux and, uh, and to have really enjoyed it. Can you remember anyone ever ringing up for advice or information where you thought, God, imagine them asking me? Um, well, we do get the auction houses phoning up now again and saying, how much is this worth? <laughs> Which we quite enjoy. But then we also phone them if it's something that we haven't uh, had recently. Yes, to be, it is better now that we're treated more as serious wine merchants and, and um, maybe they don't particularly like us but they don't let that come across in, in, in uh, their conversation with us and I think we're more accepted now. Can you remember a moment when you thought ah maybe they think we're respectable? Well, when you get invited to lunch. And by Christie's say. By Christie's say. <laughs> It's in auction rooms like this that people are persuaded to part with tens of thousands of pounds for a single bottle of wine. The man responsible for making London the epicentre of today's seismic fine wine market is Michael Broadbent, who started Christie's Wine Department in 1966. 1300, 1300, 1350, 1400. At 1400, against you, 1400, my bid, 1400. Any more, 1400. Auctioning looks terribly difficult to me. Wasn't it terrifying when you first took the rostrum? Well, I was terribly nervous when I started. In fact, I used to be sometimes physically sick. At 310, 320, on the right, at 320. And more, at 320. The first six locks I ever sold uh, were knocked down to a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> They were liqueur miniatures. But three weeks later, I received a letter. He had been let out of an institution only two weeks before he came to the sale, and he thought he was bidding for picture miniatures. <laughs> Could I let him off? <laughs> oh, my God. Lot 35, the Baron. Today, Michael's known the world over for much more than just selling. In constant demand as writer, taster and lecturer, he must be Britain's top wine export. These three rather wild, tousle-headed young chaps came in. I didn't know who they were. And they were buying all the best things. And I wasn't totally happy. And usually I rely on my, my feelings. Uh, and I, I just stopped taking bids. And I didn't notice them going out. They went out in half, apparently. Because you hadn't taken their bids. I did. I refused to take their bids. At one o'clock, the sale finished. At about five past one, I got a 
phone call from somebody representing Mr. Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, and his client uh, regarded this as a tremendous insult. And um, I've got the actual words he used, but he was about to sue me and Christie's. To 60. It was actually my worst moment uh, in, as an auctioneer. I then asked Andrew to lunch, and since when actually we've been really quite close friends. Until he sold all his wonderful other bits. Well, when I heard he sold his wonderful other I said, Andrew, how could you? Going at 1200. You and Sotheby's aren't exactly friendly rivals, are you? Um, you'll find that the rivalry between Christie's and Sotheby's as a whole has always been pretty, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily bitter, but pretty active. Serena Sutcliffe, the head of Sotheby's wine department, you don't like to go to tastings that she's at. I find it, you know, there's a chemistry between people. And um, uh, I find really... I find her really, if you really want to, I find her haughty and, uh, and rather sort of a nose in there and, uh, what is the word? Well, you've got... Pretentious is the word, if you really want the word. I think you're going to kill me for this. <laughs> <laughs> she probably thinks I'm most tiresome person too. Michael's always in a hurry, hurrying from his London flat to his office, to his club, to a tasting, so he chooses from his three bicycles. I like it. I get a tremendous feeling of um, release. If I've been worrying about something overnight, which I frequently do, the minute I get on my bike, I feel very relaxed. I had two accidents. Um, both, I regret to say, careless ladies opening car doors without looking. Unlike careless gentlemen riding the wrong way up a one-way street. Everyone's after Michael's palate. Here he is assessing 1990 Sautern for a wine magazine. I think it was it Pamela who says assertive. How about you? One or two, uh, no, but <laughs> wine! <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I started with my little red books in September 1952, and they're always exactly the same. Ideal. It's, they're terribly expensive. If you have to buy one of these with nothing in it, it costs about four pounds. It, it's an outrageous. It's a fetish. I, I sub-index them, and um, I just put the date and the, the occasion, people I'm tasting with sometimes. Your overall impression of the vintage? Hefty wines, a big vintage. Plenty of botrytis, and as David said, a fair amount of acidity, which, of course, if you've got a hefty wine and the sweet wine, you need the acidity but far more variation than I would have expected. So you've probably tasted more fine and rare wine than anybody else. Which bottles stand out? I don't know where to start. The Magnum of 1870 Lafitte from Glans Castle, which was actually opened in, in this room. It was simply perfect. Uh, 1811 Tokai Essence, for example, is a little memorable. I, I, there are so many. Uh, I adore all these wines. What do you think of these amazing prices that wine's fetching now? They are rather frightening. Lot 86, Le Pain 82, bidding will open at 16,000. 17,000, 18,000. 18,000 pounds. At 18,000 pounds. Having said that, it really doesn't, frankly, I don't care tuppence what people pay for Le Pain or Petrus. It's not in the realms of realism. It's a, it's a fantasy world. Shouldn't say this, marvelous wine. But aren't the ways of working the room, of coaxing people? Not really. There are occasions, I must say, when I've leant over and said, <laughs> I'm quite sure, just one more. Another five pounds. <laughs> Another 500 nowadays, more like. Michael probably spends more time in the air than in his office. His complex itineraries masterminded by his saintly secretary of more than 30 years. Eventually to Bali, and I returned to Singapore. And what I was hoping to do was to get a day flight from Singapore, from, ba from Bali to uh, Singapore, and a night flight back. So we don't She's having trouble finding right, an airport. I, I will, uh, <laughs> I'm just a guy who can't say no. I mean, I've been conducting sales in America for, for longer than anybody else at Christie's, since 69. And, um, 
they're very receptive. But the, the Germans, too. Uh, I like the Germans. Do I like the Germans? Well, they... <laughs> well, I like some of them. He likes them enough to be trying, at 70, to learn German so he can be master of the sale room there, too. Is das Wetter an der Nordseeküste? It's bloody awful. Oft scheint die... What the hell scheint? Wechselhaft. 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 Oh, God, it's so painful. It really is. Ferienwohnungen. Why did they make these long so long? Die Fahrt... Sounds rather rude to me. Die Fahrt hint und zurück dauert vier Stunden. Well, anyway, never mind. I'll ring you later on about this evening. OK. Yeah, bye. That's my amanuensis, my wife. We lost a handbag, because she comes to all my tastings and takes notes. Daphne keeps me in order, ticks me off constantly, criticised constantly, uh, but is very sort of phlegmatic and, um, and we were totally different in character. You'd have very different sleep patterns, don't you? Yes. I think she would never ever go to bed if I wasn't, didn't, didn't badge her. I won't tell you exactly what she does late at night, but anyway, she, um, she comes to bed very late and then in order to send herself to sleep, she rattles away with, I don't know what it's called, one of these damn Game Girl things. And the rattling keeps me awake. In fact, I find it terribly irritating. So you're crazy about Claret and she's nuts about Nintendo? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Certifiably mad to produce wine in England, but on days like this, you can't help wondering. <laughs> the fervent optimist who in 1988 decided to convert part of her husband's arable farm in Suffolk into Wiccan vineyards is Mississippi born Carla Carlyle. Don't you have to be slightly crazy to grow vines in England? I must say, on a day like today, you do feel that that dreamy optimism <laughs> that you felt in 1988 was probably misplaced. Um, I still think that the evidence is that this is going to be a very good wine-growing area. I think I'm not as loony as, as it might look. <laughs> what was your path to wine? Because you were brought up in Mississippi, your parents drank bourbon. Mississippi was a dry state at the time, and you could only get any form of alcohol by either going to a bootlegger, and the bootleggers did not sell wine, or going to Louisiana. And uh, my parents would go once a year to buy wine for Christmas, and then we would drink the red wine with uh, our turkey. And from the very first sip I ever had of it, I loved it. I thought it was just the most exciting, wonderful, delicious tasting thing I'd ever had. En route to this Elizabethan hall near Bury St Edmunds, with its 1,200 acres, Carla was a civil rights activist in California, taught English literature at university in Paris, and, crucially, met its owner, ex-Tory minister Sir Kenneth Carlyle, whom she married in 1986. She's now a columnist for Country Life as well as running the seven-acre vineyard she persuaded an initially reluctant Kenneth to let her plant. It's a very powerful smell, isn't it? Very aromatic. Mm. Mm, it, is like, it is like Sauvignon Blanc, isn't it? Vaguely sort of currenty. I love it. I I'm... don't think... I can't see how anyone, the most prejudiced person, who says, I don't like English wine, would, n would not object to that smell. They'd love it. Yes. I think that if I'm trying to woo a prejudiced <laughs> wine drinker, this is the one that I go for. So that's quite a German profile, isn't it? But not a German taste. Is that because you deliberately want to make dry wines? I deliberately go for those drier wines. There's enough of that medium German-style wine out there. It's one of the reasons why I have avoided grapes like Mellothurgal, Sauvignon Blanc, um, I really tried to go for a French style, if you can call it that, dry white wine. 
but the harvest can be more heart-rending in England than in France. Spring frosts mean crops at Wiccan can vary between 20,000 and just 3,000 bottles. Carla is a hands-on vigneron. Being so far from the equator, there's never any shortage of natural acidity. The crucial thing is the sugar level, measured here on a refractometer with Charles, the vineyard manager. It is, nearly getting on for 90. Yeah. Napa Valley grape. You drink mainly English wine now. We drink a lot of Wiccan wine because it's there. Uh, and I think that we do suffer from something that uh, in, in the Napa Valley they call cellar palate, where you drink your own wines so much that you start thinking that they're absolutely fabulous. They're absolutely the most, you know, you become hooked. You can't understand why anybody just doesn't find all of that little acidity just irresistible. <laughs> like so many English-grown grapes, Carla's are trucked to a winery an hour away with all the hardware needed for crushing them and fermenting the juice into wine. Rob Hemphill makes wine for 15 different growers. Were you inspired initially by any English wines before you planted your vineyard? I have to say I wasn't. Carla's now passionately opposed to the fad for making English wine New World-like by using fancy yeasts and oak chips. This American's after an authentically English style. So you're convinced that vine growing has a long-term future in England? I believe that it does, but it's not going to have a future if, you know, if people don't want to drink English wines. And um, I, th I think that what we've got on our side, I think that the weather is moving in our favour increasingly. <laughs> As, as long as it's treated as a, you know, a kind of, you know, I don't know, kind of... You, you buy a bottle of English wine as a souvenir. <laughs> you don't buy it because you really want to drink it. Uh, it's, you know, that, the enemy is this prejudice. Making white wine in England's one thing, but making red wines surely a perversion, or in Carla's case, a hobby horse, dependent on hybrid vines with smelly American genes. It's got a bit of a foxy taste. It doesn't, it doesn't smell 100% whiny to me. No. You know. mm. I suppose it's just unfamiliar smells mm -hmm. that um, stops me from going, this is the, you know, the best red wine you've ever fantastic. had. <laughs> have you had any feedback from your French friends about your English wines? Well, I have to say they were all so dubious. And uh, they, they pleaded with me. To, to not plant a vineyard. And, um, and I have a, a great friend, Lucien Legrand, who said... He's the great Parisian wine merchant, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, the great Parisian wine merchant and, and the great supporter of little winemakers and country wines and the, the winemaker as an artisan. And, um, and he, he said, you know, when I started telling him the varieties I was interested in planting, he kept saying, it will break your heart. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, and I think he's, I have to say, he's my greatest supporter now. I like your white wine very much, but I can't understand, really, the point of the red. I would say that it's just going to require a little time and a little patience. I think that I'm going to get there with the red. Um, and I've got, you know, I've, I certainly, thank goodness, you know, have, <laughs> have customers that aren't as discriminating as Jancis Robinson. <laughs> because um, I've, you know, I've sold out of my 92 and my 93 red. And it's a great challenge. 
it's a great challenge to make those reds. And come back in a couple of years' time and I will offer you a lovely Somerset goat's cheese, some lovely walnut bread, and one of my red wines, and I think that you'll find it pretty irresistible. Okay, I will. <laughs> trading in the city. Some of his best sales are to the Far East. He sells futures. But what his company, Corny and Barrow, deal in is wine. Frightfully smart wine. Adam's a frightfully smart chap. As managing director of the country's grandest wine business, Adam de la Falaise, Brett, Brett Smith, yes, really, commutes from Pimlico to a converted rectory on the fringes of the city. There's nothing as vulgar as a shop front. Good morning, Anne. Good morning, Anne. Good morning, Corny and Barrow. Yes, certainly. May I ask who's calling? Thank you very much, Mrs Sykes. I'll just transfer you. But there are some notably well-spoken staff and no fewer than three royal warrants. So you find it quite difficult to get into the wine trade, didn't you? Incredibly. Uh, I mean, I was turned down as a van driver by Fields <laughs> uh, in Slane Avenue. How about uh, Corny's? Uh, Corny's turned me down three times in nine months, so yes, I <laughs> didn't have a very good record there either. What would you have done if you hadn't got into the wine trade? It's a very good question. Uh, I think I probably would have sold aero engines or something. You, I, you're a bit of a cars and bikes and boats yeah, and planes I like, boy, I aren't like, you? Yeah. I like anything mechanical. Mm. Um, it's a wonderful way of, <laughs> of switching off. When not polishing his gaskets, Adam works on his cherished exclusivities, including the most famous names in Burgundy and Bordeaux. The son of the owner of the fabulous Chateau Petrus has been spending a few months working with Adam Brett Smith and his wine buyer, Nicola Archdeacon Butler. But it's slightly disjointed, isn't it? It's got that sort of supple it's weird, isn't it? fruit on the, on the beginning and then that slightly hard metallic mm. structure on the finish. Yeah, this is about, I think it's such fun about Bordeaux. You've got well, one, two, three, what have we tasted? Four, five wines from almost exactly the same area. Same vintage. Same vintage, predominantly the same grape variety or varieties, and they're all utterly, okay. utterly different. And uh, if you had a desert island, you'd have to take Bordeaux as your, as your, as your baby. You'd have to be. And what sort of wine do you drink at home? Uh, Price-wise or quality-wise? Uh, I guess between sort of five, six, seven pounds a bottle. Really? As, as every day. Yes, really. I can't, I find that terribly difficult to believe. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. What intrigues me about Corny and Barrow is that you're all terribly, terribly pucker and you do have to have a double barrel surname to work here, really. No, you and you do have to have a, as good a tailor as you, almost. Um, but that doesn't actually reflect. The, the city as it is at the moment, does it? I mean, you, you know, you ought to be all in red braces and yelling down mobiles and stuff. Well, I can't speak for double barrel names or, or, or good tailors, but there are come, unquestionably, come. <laughs> <laughs> unquestionably certain qualities that are timeless and, and aren't subject to change. And that's uh, courtesy uh, and and I don't think courtesy is the um, hallmark of the modern financial world, is it? Well, it may not be, but it's certainly something that they like, quite like receiving when they buy things. They say they've cut down substantially, but lunch in the clubby dining room still plays an important part in the corny sales manual. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> Morning. I sent you a fax about the Bollinger. Did you get it? Does it have to be the same vintage, or would you like something else apart from 82? Next door is the firm's financially all-important broking division, where fine wines are traded just like stocks and shares. If it's got anything to do with Mandy, it's bound to, it's bound to be a problem. Now, this is where I might find some red braces. As uh, Petrus Magnums only, not bottles. Uh, 5,650. <laughs> it's cheap. Much of the wine sold by Corny's brokers is stored here, 
in a bonded warehouse in deepest Essex. In fact, many of these cases are traded several times before they leave here, having been imported by Corneys originally, bought by one private customer, sold to another, and then to another. Corneys have created their very own little market of very grand stuff. to drink at the moment? At the highest level, uh, there is a much greater involvement from the Far East, uh, which is a very new market and, and becoming a very strong one. But this huge increase in prices must mean that there's been a big increase in um, the amount of fake wine. There have been instances of fake bottles circulating in the market, yes. To counter these dastardly counterfeiters, the owner of Chateau Petrus has come up with a cunning ploy. And this is a device on the label which only shows up under a certain light. And if I pass this up the label, you can see marks on the label. Gosh, it looks the completely label. random, doesn't it? All those little flecks in different colours. Yeah, it's quite pretty. Pretty, but jolly difficult to copy. Very difficult to copy. Go on. Oh, well, I'll give up. I was thinking of counterfeiting Petrus, but I won't anymore. Have Not you good, have you ever tasted uh, a wine you thought was fake? Yes, I have indeed. Um, in Hong Kong uh, last year, no, two years ago. And the difficulty was that it was actually printed um, on the menu what the wine was. And um, the test was one which he'd played on a number of wine merchants before because he actually knew uh, that the wine was fake, but he used it as a vehicle for testing God. abilities of um, people who were trying to sell him wine. What a terrible trick! Not, not very pleasant. He'd cooked up this wine deliberately to be a fake. No, he'd bought it in good faith uh, and, and had spent upwards of £6,000 a case on it and had bought three cases. In the city, Corney and Barrow are also well known for their wine bars, heady with testosterone. That's specifically aimed at, at, at the younger Turk in the city, the new boys. <laughs> no, absolutely. What do you sell lots of there? Mostly champagne. Uh, champagne is, is perhaps the drink to both be happy with and to be tragic with, and uh, there's a lot of that in the city. Don't worry about it, just buy the house off it. There's always a double magnum on ice, four bottles in one, for those with a real statement to make. It's remarkable the number of times that that's opened. How often? I would say two, three times a week. And sometimes they go on and order a second? Uh, very rarely. <laughs> <laughs> This list is one of the handsomest in the, the wine trade. It must be the most expensive to produce. It is incredibly expensive to produce, but it's still given free. How much? How much does it cost you, a prop? It's about four pounds a copy. Okay. It comes with the promise that if it doesn't entertain or inform, then they can throw it away, and we haven't lost one yet. How do you know? They may be, there may be waste no, paper bins littered we with know your our lists. customers intimately. <laughs> This is the Oxford the tourists flock to see, and undergraduates occasionally notice. But there are treasures below ground too, college cellars, seen only by wine butlers whose job is to empty them, and the dons whose job is to fill them. 
At Lincoln College, that person is Nigel Wilson, a fellow in classics who also runs the self-financing list of 20,000 bottles stored in various cellars all over the college. How are wine stewards chosen? If you reveal that you're keen on your wine, then it's really Buggins' turn. I mean, the, the, by the, <laughs> the effluxion of time, as they say, you become the senior person <laughs> or the only person willing to take on the job. And so you have this onerous task. How long did it take you before you were Lincoln's wine steward? Oh, I had been a fellow here, I think, for 30 years <laughs> before I rose to these giddy heights. Um, Nigel, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm revealing one of the mysteries of the college. Uh, I think this, this is a somewhat fair. unexpected place to find the cell, but I did the show. <laughs> Safety precaution, we will do that. Well, Steve, take care. So, what kind? Uh, there must be somewhere, yes. Oh, here, okay. There. Oh, great. Got it. Correct. Right. Now, let's see. Quite a lot. Brand new du Cru, how's that? Pretty good. Uh, Pichon Ooh, Longville. Yes, gosh, that's uh, that Pichon Lalande 82. Uh, You've got lots of Which it. you're selling for £12.25 mm. a bottle. Do you know how much I saw it on a, a merchant's list for the other day? Probably £40. More like 200 Really? 200 mm. Oh, I must look into this. <laughs> <laughs> what no. do you make of that? I've never come across that before either. Well, it says 13% alcohol. It's a good start. Yes, that's what I always feel. These are double racks, of course. Oh, I see, so you've got twice as <laughs> yes. much of this oh, yes. stuff as I thought. Yes, yes, yes quite. Oh. Oh, we drink right. rather less port than we used, and probably less than, than other colleges. A good deal of port here. Masses of port. Yes, quite a bit. That says Croft 70. We bought a very great deal of that. Fonseca 83 vintage port and 20.5% alcohol. <laughs> There's Wars 83. Graham. Well, I don't think you need to buy port in a hurry, do you? No, I don't think I do. Um... Gosh. Oxbridge is a honeypot for wine merchants who come to hawk their wares at tastings like this one in Trinity. For Nigel's just one of scores of wine stewards choosing wine for his fellow fellows and some basic lubrication for the undergraduates. This is what you might call a perk of the job. Apart from the odd college feast, the dons pay for these wines, but at more or less cost price. Do the fellows like to stick to French wines? I've bought in wines from Australia, Italy, Spain, the Lebanon, California, Chile. I've had wine from Argentina. And you didn't have any complaints? No, 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 I don't get complaints, no, no. Uh, I think the, the fellows are taking their medicine quite well. <laughs> this is cellar number two, yes. is it? Yes. Right, now here is an annex to the... A good deal of roan here, but there is a mixture. Now, is this the sassy kind? Yes, it is. Hooray. I don't know where to find the other Italian wine. Which colleges do you time. really look forward to dining at from the point of view of wine? Um, let me see. Oh, there's a very good cellar in Maudlin, for instance, um, Queen's, All Souls. There are several which have very good cellars. The question is, what will they bring out? <laughs> oh, Chateauneuf, the Vieux Telegraph of 89. 
We have got quite a lot of roan. That's absolutely chock full of your favourite ingredient, I seem to remember. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a hard drinking college? I don't think it's particularly hard drinking. Uh, um, I wonder. <laughs> remember. You chose that yes. for the alcohol again, yes. didn't you? Yes, that's 14 right. 14%. 14%, yes, <laughs> yes. There. Oh, this California sticky, late, yes. sweet Sauvignon yeah. Blanc. Yes. Yeah. yes. That was almost given away by Adnams. So I bought 144 of these little fellows. <laughs> and um, uh, we've been getting through them steadily. <laughs> I wonder where those the, the gems on your list are. You know the Mouton no, I, seventy and the Akem and I, things. I don't know. I simply don't know. Feet <laughs> <laughs> rack. <laughs> At sixty-two, Nigel keeps fit on Oxford's real tennis court. He was recently married for the first time to another wine-loving classicist. Two kids. Yes, I think so. Worse than one. Worse than five. Better than six. Two chairs. Now for some palate workout with the College Wine Committee assessing some of their 1989 clarets. Patache d'eau. Oh, that really is rather nice, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's good. It's very smooth. But that's ready now. That's ready. Yes, mm -hmm. that is ready. Now, will they like that strange one I'd never heard of? Oh. Mm -hmm. They're undecided about it. Not so it's not, so it's not an obvious winner, is it? No. Not initially. No. And lastly, Chateau Beaumont. I think David's right, actually. We should drink that soon, probably soon. Yes. <laughs> soon, yeah. so, so I think soon as possible, soon, I think. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. So you're going to show me another cellar? Yes, this is the main cellar. Uh, what do you keep in this one? Mm. Um, it's rather easier to get into, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's the pouch there. Oh. Um. Uh. This house belongs to one of the wine trade's most colourful families. In fact, possibly its only colourful family, now that so many of the interesting characters have been subsumed into a morass of middle management executives. It was Ronald Avery who established the family's reputation for eccentricity, while making Avery's of Bristol the most respected independent wine merchant in Britain, if not the world. He did everything on the spur of the moment and thought nothing of leaving his office to sail to France in his converted German torpedo boat or encouraging his friend, the Bishop of Southwark, to join him for nude bathing in the local river. The company is now run by his son, John, who, as a constantly traveling master of wine and chairman of the International Wine and Food Society, is just as restless. Your father was quite famous for his behind-the-scenes blending, wasn't he? In fairness, he never blended what I'd call grape wines. Um, but, I mean, we had a wine called Cote de Fronzac, for example. And Fronzac wines in those days were very tough. And so he decided to blend in about 20% of white wine in it, believe it or not. And it made it far more palatable and far easier to drink. I mean, not strictly kosher in terms of calling it Cote de Fronzac, but nevertheless. The Avery's house, notoriously chaotic, had been specially tidied up for our visit, but still there were piles considered unbroachable. And jobs, such as this hole in the main staircase, which have remained untackled for several years now. 
In the old days, this rather wonderful building was Avery's headquarters, including a very successful bar named after the liner whose panelling was specially bought up to furnish it. You can just pick out what remains of the name of this famous Bristol wine merchant. Nowadays, they've moved across Park Street to more modest premises. And behind the shop, there's this wine warehouse, which has exactly the same wines as the shop, but at subtly different prices, as well as a whole load of other wines. Then on top of that, there's a mail order business, which has a completely different lot of wines from either the shop or the wine warehouse. It's all very, very Avery's. What do you think are your strengths? Um, I, I think I get on quite well with people. I'm quite good at talking about wine. I'm quite good at finding wines, and I think I can taste pretty well. He certainly can. He is valued as a wine judge all over the world, even if he is congenitally and quite engagingly disorganized. Um, now, where's my glass? Has he lost? <laughs> It was there, it was there. To me, the South African wine is a bit broader, a bit more earthy. It doesn't quite have that nice, lively character that the, the French wine had. It just doesn't come up and hit you. Now, right, who preferred the French Chardonnay? The, the uh, what was it, Saint Romain, wasn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, and who preferred the South African? John Avery's most successful business venture actually had nothing to do with wine. At one time, he earned more from a few shares in cats than from the wine business. What has been your biggest business disaster? The biggest business disaster was in the late um, 70s when we had a massive theft in the, in the business. And that's really what's resulted in the business not being mine anymore. Although his four children are all interested in wine, John had to sell the firm. It's now owned by a German wine company, delighted to bask in the reflected glory of the Avery's name, however unglamorous the company's new headquarters. I get frustrated. I, people wouldn't believe it. I actually would like to be more organized. You ought to have an absolutely terrifying secretary. Well, I had a French girl um, who wasn't particularly terrifying, but she was very good, and she got to know um, my foibles. I remember why I employed her. On her CV, it said, trained as an air traffic controller in Caracas. And I decided someone who could train as an air traffic controller in Caracas could probably work for me. <laughs> that is the bugbear of my life. Going into John's office is, um, it hurts sometimes, you know. Do you sometimes think you need a, a business manager? Well, oh yes, I mean, I, I employed one uh, some years ago, and I mean, I've certainly since 78, um, I've sort of hoped to have one. But you don't have such a person now? Not at this immediate moment, no. Sort of dumb them down to me. The warehouse next door contains a rich mixture of wines stored for customers, wines for which Avery's are agents, John was a new world pioneer in the 60s, and some surprising antiques, such as this minor 83 white burgundy. And, uh, but down below is just the single cases. We try to keep just one broken case of each wine duty paid in case there's an emergency order. We can get stuff out of bond, of course. There's some Grange there, which is always... That's nice. Highly sought after. But I don't think you're going to have an emergency order for a 93 um, Cote de saint mont are you? Yes. Uh, yeah? Oh, yeah, if a restaurant suddenly runs yeah? out and they want it 93? Isn't it a bit long in the tooth? Um, no, that, that's red anyway, that one, I think, isn't it? No, I don't think so. Let's have a look. Oh, no, it's no, just white. white. Oh, I yeah. don't know why that's there. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, how many agencies do you have? A few. They come and go a bit. Claude Duval we had, then we lost it, then we haven't got it back again. The Tyrrells we introduced to this country, then we lost the Tyrrells agency in the mid-'80s, and then we got it back, and now we've lost it again. John's wife, Sarah, on the other hand, couldn't be more loyal. Can I put this in the fridge? Do you want this out? 
She's preparing their eldest child's birthday dinner. While John has been trawling the stupendous Avery family cellar, which many have envied and almost as many have benefited from. Its foundations were laid by the incomparable Ronald. Well, one Sunday morning, he had... Um, uh, they were always terribly generous, the Avery's. A large number of people were gathered there, and they would have drinks in the morning. And on this particular morning, um, Ronald was standing by the window, very, very gently pouring out some wine, making certain that the sediment didn't get into the glass. Such was the concentration, I suppose, that the next part of the story he wouldn't be aware of. He swung round into the room with a bottle and hit a lady straight between the eyes. <laughs> the lady collapsed backwards into the room, and all Ronald did was to turn back to the window and say, blast, I've disturbed the sediment. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Tidmarsh is an old friend of this close-knit family and well used to the hazards of the ramshackle household. Well, you would go into the downstairs loo and you'll find that the handle will come off. <laughs> people, people have possibly died in there. <laughs> Simon Loftus of Adams got docked in the upstairs loo for about half an hour. We wonder where on earth he got to. So did he, but uh, <laughs> we let him out in time for dinner. That was another grub scoop. Help! Let me out! The important thing is not to let me I spent my first weekend in this garden almost exactly 20 years ago, pulling out forget-me-nots for my wine-writing mentor, Edmund Penning Rousel. The name's familiar to members of the Wine Society, of which he was chairman for 23 years, to readers of the FT, for whom at 84 he's Britain's longest-serving wine writer, and to anyone who cares about red Bordeaux. Claret, as he's always called it, has been his great love other than his wife, Meg, whom he met in Hyde Park 65 years ago. How did you start collecting wine? My first order to Avery's was delivered in the week that the Second World War began. And I used to get wine under the, kept under my bed. And did you always favour Red Bordeaux? It was thought that, that Claret is, is, is the most interesting wine, varied. Yes, it does double a bit as a larder up at the top, doesn't it, this cellar? Yes, because it's cool. This is the anteroom to Edmund's cellar, after a big clear-out, when he reluctantly sold stacks of younger vintages. So, into the real treasure trove. Oh, Edmund, still pretty well stocked. <laughs> Gosh! Oh. You've got so many 61s left. That's wonderful. Well, God. so far, they're, they're, all, they're all right, mostly. Let's see, what's this? 61 Latour, Pamal. One of the best of the vintage. Not bad at all. Well, you've got three bottles down here of 61 Petrus. Yes. That must be worth quite a bob. I, I talked to Jean-Pierre Moex when we met, actually in Venice some years ago, and he said, that means you've got more than I have. He said, I've only got two bottles. I'm just paying 20,000 francs for a third bottle in Paris. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> yeah. These um, labels are new, These, um, the big 61 and so forth. My son did this because of my sight being poor, so I could see roughly what the vintage is. Yeah, you wouldn't want to make a mistake, would you? Gosh, and 45, see, that's 61, 45. Yes. The great vintages well, of uh, just a few. the yes. last That's right. 60 years. Sure. And, Mouton, um, including Mouton Rothschild, which the Baron Philippe said would last until the 21st century, and he's obviously going to be proved right. When was the last time you drank this 45 Mouton? Can't remember. Mm. Some time ago. It's I'm, one of the classic wines, isn't it? It is, yes, um, and it is very good. Well, last time I tasted it, it was very good. Heavens, you've got so many bottles of it! Oh, wonderful. Well, well, wonderful, and the whole lot's wonderful. It really is. Well, it's a, a testament to how sensible you've been to I, lay I mean, down I've this lot. I've always been a collector. Yeah, well, it's 
It's a wonderful collection. With his cultivated country life, punctuated by visits to his London club, Edmund is a most unlikely hardline left winger. His friend Cyril Ray used to say he was a conservative in everything but his politics. Did you never feel that connoisseurship was perhaps incompatible with communism? I always said that I didn't think that the Tories should have all the best wines. <laughs> Well, I have here just one of your, how many cellar books do you have? Eight, six? Um... Eight at the moment. And I've opened it on the, the greatest, most memorable wine I've ever drunk, which was Chateau Cheval Blanc, 1947. And I see that you cleverly bought in March 1950, about a month before I was born, six bottles for 14 shillings and threepence each. Now selling at £2,000 a bottle, I'm, apparently. Ridiculous. <laughs> And then you go on, you had an awful lot of it, Edmund. Well, I think, you know, the greatest vintage uh, probably was 1929. But, of course, I didn't come to it until it was 20 years old. That's right, you bought it in 1949 and 50 from Avery's at 22 and 6 and then 26 shillings. And you served the first bottle to Harry War and your friend... John Betjamin. Oh, yes. Very fine, rich nose, plenty of colour. But the expectations aroused by these were slightly disappointed oh. as the wine went away at the end and lacked sugar at the finish. Well. Anyone remotely interested in wine could spend many a happy hour nosing around Chateau Penning Rousel because it's stuffed with wine memorabilia. Edmund doesn't throw everything out. He keeps his special bottles, like 1904 Merton Chandon <laughs> Champagne. And this is a Burgundy, a red Burgundy, La Tache, just legible there, something that sells for hundreds of pounds a bottle today. I think the vintage is 1911 see what he says on the back and he says it was one of the finest bottles of old burgundy I recollect drinking and appearing half its age sweet but not sweetened wonderful stuff the arch right winger Wagner is one of Edmund's unlikelier passions I hope the ladies don't make me play at my funeral. Over the years, you've constantly nagged me about buying each new vintage as it comes on the market. I don't think I nag. I can't believe it. That's it. No, I think every, every year you say, you must get some, you must get some. Yes. What's the appeal of wine to you? I think it's a... Th I don't think it's much fun drinking wine alone. I think, really, the opportunities for discussion about wine with a party, a small party, two people, is good enough. You can't get such um, pleasure, interest, disagreement. Do you find it a bit bitter? Look, Meg always finds Claire bitter, even, <laughs> even, even in 29. You've had a lot of years to get used to it. <laughs> Every dinner's carefully recorded in EPR's archives. He has iron rules about food as about everything. Cheese must be hard, meat must be unadorned. Nothing remotely sweet or sour with his beloved claret. So, Edmund, does this, um, does this meal pass muster for you, as far as your rules of matching wine and food are concerned? Yes. Yes. Death to wine is one of your great phrases. Yeah. <laughs> horse radish We're sauce. We're determined to pull this out of you, Edmund. Yeah, no. Horse radish sauce, yes. Uh, Mustard. Completely to be on the pail. Red currant jelly. Red currant jelly. Oh! Yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 mint, sauce. mint sauce, which I love. Um, but you wouldn't ever have it with wine. Thank you very much. Great. It's nice wine, isn't it? It is nice wine. Mm, just gets better and better towards the end, doesn't it? 
that finish just keeps reverberating. I had so many lovely wines around this table. Thank you very much.